Okay, hi everybody. My name is Haley Giambalvo, and I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the Alamo Area Master Naturalist Demonstration Garden. And that garden, if you're not familiar with it, is actually right outside of this building. There's a path that goes right behind the Urban Ecology Center. And if you take that path, the first, th first thing that you're going to run into is this garden. So excited to spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about the paint plate here at Harburger Park. Uh, first, just a little overview about the Elmo Area Master Naturalist, if you're not familiar with our organization. Um, our chapter is one of over 40 chapters here in Texas. Uh, we are a group of trained volunteers, uh, trained on all things Texas ecology, and our mission is to, to educate and provide outreach and service in um, areas related to our natural resources, at different um, parks, natural areas, uh, around San Antonio. And um, just a few things about our membership. We have uh, 343 active members in 2022, which totaled over 29 uh, service hours at projects um, throughout the city. And we have a, a quite a bit of overlap in our membership. So uh, about a quarter of our master naturalists are also members of our chapter here. So we've got a lot of native plant enthusiasts as part of the Alamo Area Master Naturalists. And if you ever have any questions about the program, I always like to talk about it, so you're welcome to, to shoot me an email and um, I can send you some information. Uh, the garden is one of our chapter projects and it's uh, maintained by a group of volunteers led by uh, two master naturalists, Evelyn, Evelyn Kenrod and Patsy Coons. And each month we have a work day there. You can see some photos of our, of our group um, at the garden. And we uh, did a combined 336 volunteer hours there uh, last year. As far as the, the mission of our garden, we have um, a few goals. Uh, primarily, it's just to really showcase all the amazing plants we have here in Texas uh, to the public. So the garden is open to the public at all times. Uh, they can come in and look at the plants, and each plant has an information sign next to it, which I'll show you later, that um, provides uh, the, the name and, and growing information in case uh, someone wants to take a picture of it and go home, try to look for it at the nursery and put it in their own yard. And then our third goal is to provide um, some habitat and food sources for our local insects and wildlife uh, that we have that frequent the garden, which I'll be showing you. Uh, as far as the, um, the, the timeline, the construction of this garden, our original garden um, actually dates back to 1997. It was at a different location. The first Alamo area demonstration garden uh, was located along the San Antonio River uh, for about 10 years. It was um, across from the HEB headquarters near Cesar Chavez, and it was on a property that was owned by the San Antonio River Authority. Uh, but in 2017, they decided to sell that uh, land and they helped our chapter relocate. And we decided to choose Philhard Burger Park as the new home for the demonstration garden. So in 2017, um, uh, that year was spent kind of getting approvals from the city, uh, seeking information from landscaping companies, and 2018, Blue Heron was chosen for the design of the garden and they uh, spent the year constructing it. I'll show you some pictures from that. Uh, and then 2019, our volunteers put in all the perennials and that fall in October, it was open to the public. So now in 2023, we're in our fourth year. Uh, the, the perennials are really maturing nicely. Uh, we're just at the point now where we're doing uh, basic monthly maintenance on the garden and replanting um, as needed. Here's some photos from what the area looked like before the garden was installed. So at the top, this is um, the original space. It was a, just kind of an open uh, uh, butterfly meadow, I believe. And then uh, below you can see the, the construction happening, some walkways and distinct garden beds being put in. We also added uh, two raised beds to the garden. And the last thing that went in was a, a tall fence, and that was not to keep uh, people out, but it was to keep deer out because a lot of our pretty plants are not necessarily deer resistant. So we wanted to, to keep those protected um, so that the public could see them um, at their best. So that was 2018. And then this is, if you visit the garden um, in the next couple of weeks, it's gonna look a lot like this. This was a photo taken last year about this time. And we're just at about the point where a lot of our Texas wildflowers are starting to bloom with the length of flower. It's very lush and, um, and green. Here's some more pictures of the garden. 
um, from different angles. Uh, activities were taken in the fall. Uh, we try to embrace kind of a wild, um, natural aesthetic. Uh, we don't try to do anything too manicured there. So you can see, you can see the plants kind of in their, their native habitat. Um, but what we did find is that if we don't do any maintenance, uh, Mother Nature can quickly try to reclaim the garden, or more accurately, some non-native invasives can uh, take control, like Bermuda grass. Uh, and this was kind of the shape of the garden um, after COVID. We weren't able to get into volunteer for about six months. And um, in the fall and around October, I think when these were taken in 2020, there was a lot of um, Bermuda and other um, weeds and things that had Kind of taken over the bed, so we've been um, we've spent time kind of getting it back into good shape, and it's looking very nice right now. Uh, just a few cool facts about the garden. Uh, one thing that I think is really neat is that we really do not water any of the plants in the garden. Um, when we first put them in the ground, we might throw a bucket of water on them to get them to start it, but after that, it's really on. They're on their own, and these plants are all in full sun. In the hot Texas heat, and they're they're thriving. They're doing great. Um, if you go last August, perhaps after our really really great summer, it's not going to look uh, its best. But all those plants survived, and they're coming back looking great again in the spring. So it's really a testament to how drought tolerant a lot of our Texas native plants are. And, and um, in terms of maintenance, all we're really doing is is just um, weeding the beds. Primarily, I'm digging up Bermuda grass because it always finds a way to get in from the surrounding, um, we have a grassy savanna area surrounding our garden. Um, we do some, some basic pruning um, in the winter, and that's about it. Um, this is one morning a month that uh, our volunteers are there. And then there's an example of one of the signs that I think are really helpful. It's got the common name, the scientific name, and a little information about when you can expect to see blooms, how tall it gets, what the sun needs are, and then my favorite part is what type of benefits uh, they offer to wildlife. In terms of what you're, you'll find in the garden, obviously you're going to find a lot of plants. We have over a hundred uh, Texas native species, um, from trees to shrubs, ornamental grasses, annuals, and some ground covers. Because we have so many um, different plants in the garden, we track a lot of different insects, and over 100 species of insects have been documented there. Uh, we did a bird count in October of 2020, a bird count, a butterfly count uh, in October of 2021, and they counted 17 different species of butterflies that day. Uh, so there's all these butterflies in this garden. It's one of my favorite things is to just go and, and see all the butterflies and other insects on a sunny day. And we get a lot of birds too, a lot of hummingbirds, um, other small uh, reptiles, lizards, amphibians. So it's it's a pretty neat place in terms of viewing some of our Texas wildlife. I'll give you some examples here. Uh, but first, if you want to know more about the, the plants we have, one of our volunteers created this really um, detailed and amazing map of the garden. And it uh, is updated regularly, so that will show you all the plantings we have both inside the gate and then surrounding um, in the surrounding area. And you could get that from getting the QR code. It's also on our Alamo Area Master Naturalist website. Here's just a few examples of all the cool insects that we see. And I have to give a shout out to Patsy Coons because she took a lot of these photos. She's a wonderful photographer of of uh, all wildlife, insects and birds, and she took some of these neat photos. And in fact, if you go to the garden, we have a kiosk on the outside of the garden that has this poster that Patsy made that shows you all of the different butterflies that frequent the garden. So if you're there and you see a butterfly that you're not sure what it is, you can check out the, the poster and you'll probably see it on there. In terms of wildlife, as I said, we get a lot of hummingbirds and also some cool birds like a um, loggerhead shrike, uh, the red shouldered hawk, even a greater roadrunner has been spotted there. Um, when I was there a couple weeks ago, there was a Texas climbing lizard. Um, and then we do get deer on the outskirts <laughs> of the garden looking in, um, <laughs> longingly looking in. Uh, if you're into iNaturalist, we do have a specific um, location page on iNaturalist, so you can see all the different 
species that people have recorded there, uh, over well, 277, it says, um, have been uh, documented through Inaculus. So I've included a QR code to our Inaculus page if you want to check that out. And then I just wanted to show you a little bit of how the garden just changes throughout the season. It's really fun to see it at different times of the year because it's going to look different every time you go. Uh, but this is what it's going to be looking like right now. Uh, in the spring, we do have a lot of annuals and, and, um, and other Texas uh, wildflowers like blue bonnets, blanket flower, um, prairie verbena. The one on the bottom left is blooming right now. That is called foxglove pinstamen. It's a really pretty uh, plant, and I've seen bumblebees climb all the way in there uh, to get the the uh, the nectar from the, from the pollen from those flowers. And the red yucca, we have a nice uh, group of red yucca that's about to bloom as well. In the summer is when a lot of our drought tolerant uh, shrubs really start to shine. Uh, the flame acanthus, uh, the zexminia, the rock rose, and of course, grape mist flower, which brings all the, the queen butterflies and some monarchs you know, from late summer on to the garden. Uh, we have frog fruit, and the one on the bottom lower left is bee balm or lemon mint. And then in the fall is when our ornamental grasses really shine like this beautiful Lindheimer mealy. Uh, our autumn sage really blooms throughout the year. It seems like we have a nice you know, new wave of color in the fall. Uh, we have some goldenrod in the garden. And we do have several types of milkweed. This picture on the bottom left is Izodes milkweed, and that, that think, blooms uh, primarily in the fall. It has a cool bloom. And then even in the winter, as the plants are going dormant, the garden is still really beautiful. Uh, there's neat seed heads. Some of our grasses, like the bushy blue stem, are beautiful in winter. We have some trees that are berry producing, like possum haw holly and evergreen sumac. And even as early as December, January, those wildflower seed seedlings are already starting to come up to get ready for spring. So definitely come to the garden throughout the year to, to see it change. Um, there's always something new blooming. I think that's it. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. And uh, that I link to our Facebook page there. If you're not currently following the Master Naturalist, uh, you're welcome to follow us on Facebook. Yeah. What day is your work day? Uh, what day is our work day? So typically, I believe it's the third Thursday of the month. Um, and I believe. Right now, we can only have uh, a certified master naturalist that can volunteer there just because of like, liability issues. But yeah, I think it's a third Thursday. Yeah. Could you please show the QR code for the announcement? Absolutely. The QR code for the I announcement stage. There you go. All right. Well, thank you guys. Oh, yeah. So, did, um, you know, where you, you have established plants, but then the ones that are blooming at different times of the year, for like the spring flowers that are receding, are you collecting, is your pattern to collect those seeds and then scatter them in November where you want them, or do you just let them come up and then in the spring you reorganize everything? Depending on where they've been planted. Yeah, they plant themselves. Typically, they like to replant themselves in the gravel pathways. For whatever reason, they like the decomposed granite better than the actual uh, bed. Um, so we pretty much just let the seeds drop where they're at. We'll clean them up toward the end of the summer when they start looking um, not so great. But you know, we leave the seed heads up as long as we can for the birds and, and those kind of things. Uh, but we don't do a lot of managing where they drop their seeds, or we don't really like scatter them. The prairie verbena. That's just comes up wherever it comes up. Yeah. Question for the people online. Yes, her question was uh, for the wildflowers that are between, are we collecting those seeds and then rescattering them in the fall to where we want them to reseed? And I said we really don't do any type of management like that. Just kind of let them see what they want. Other than when they do get into the garden paths, we will clean that up just to keep the paths clear. Yeah. The other thing about that is that we try to leave as much of the sea heads as we can because of the birds. Exactly. Through the winter. So 
So Wendy made a great point. So we do really try to keep the seed heads up as much as we can because the, you will see the birds uh, feasting on them. I come in the garden in the morning with the first one there, but before we scare away the birds, and a ton of like uh, lesser goldfinches will come up from the, the uh, flowers they've been eating the seed heads. So they're very busy there when we're not around. Uh, so. Online, are any of the plants you mentioned deer resistant? Are any of the plants deer resistant? Yeah, there's definitely some deer resistant ish ones in there. Um, I have to think off the top of my head of what I'd say red yucca would be pretty deer resistant, at least the base of it. Um, you can tell me if some others that I believe that the gray guy is a good one. Flavicanthus, um, yep, the grasses. In the grasses, yeah. So there definitely are um, plenty of deer resistant ones in there. We just had enough that weren't deer resistant to want to keep it enclosed. All right. Thank you, guys. Presentation. The uh, door prizes. We have two door prizes, you guys, for the people in the room. Fred? Hey, you're back. Okay. I don't know how many dates in this one to mess up. So um, um, I'm going to be showing you just some of the features that you may or may not have noticed. Um, these are uh, designed into this whole area around the Urban Ecology Center. And um, they're known as nature based infrastructure features. I guess we can get, okay. if we can get rid of that thing. I guess we can. I want to get rid of that thing at the top. No, I guess we can't. So okay. don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. okay, so nature based solutions, what are they? They are actions to protect, sustainably manage, or restore natural or modified ecosystems to address societal challenges, simultaneously providing benefits for people and the environment. And when we use nature-based solutions, some of the outcomes that we can see are increased resiliency of natural hazards and climate impacts, and primarily that's due to the use of native plants that are appropriate for the particular site. We can also see reduced operation and management costs for heating, cooling, and stormwater management. We can see reduced flooding and reduced costs for stormwater management. And we can also often connect communities with green spaces, which has tremendous benefits. These are just some of the key. There are other really beneficial outcomes um, from using nature-based solutions. And so what I'm gonna focus on, really the whole park is a nature-based infrastructure that the park, some of you might remember, was almost going to be sold for development. And then we wouldn't have as much of this amazing open space with these amazing new plant communities that had happened. And so the city of San Antonio, fortunately, got the park. But I'm going to focus on just some of the features right around the Urban Ecology Center, which was very thoughtfully designed. And in particular, I'm going to talk about nature-based infrastructure that deals with stormwater management. So on-site permanent stormwater practices that are blending in with the environment right around here. And they include practices like permeable pavement, vegetated swale, and rainwater capture. And then I'm also going to show you the treatment train concept. So you might have seen this if you saw any of them when you parked. So the drive that you drive in at is typical asphalt. But where you park, the parking stalls are actually permeable. And this is an overhead view of all of those parking stalls shown in red. And you can see that they've been um, filled with decomposed granite. So this system, there are a lot of different permeable pavement systems out there. This particular system you see here is called the plastic grid paver system. And this one is filled with decomposed granite. And what this does is instead of an impervious asphalt surface or concrete surface that sends the rain runoff quickly off of the surface, these allow that rain to uh, go into the ground. And so here's a typical cross section. You can see in the upper right, that's a plastic repaver. They go on the surface and they get filled with the material. Out here, it's decomposed granite, but in the lower right, you can see another system that's here in San Antonio that's filled with gravel. And then on the left, you see a cross section and that particular one shows grass. So some of these can be vegetated, especially if they're like overflow parking situation where it's not constant 
um, constantly used for cars, but they tend to have the permeable layer at the top. And then underneath that, there's another uh, reservoir layer, permeable uh, layer as well, but it's designed to hold all that weight of the cars. And again, these can be pretty complex. You can have many, many layers underneath these systems and they can actually store some of the runoff. And we're seeing a lot of these different practices going in around San Antonio in our region. And one of, one of the things that, uh, well, what these practices do, they help to slow the runoff down instead of sending it off really quickly. They help you to be able to distribute that runoff around the landscape, which is a more naturally uh, managed stormwater system. Um, and then they uh, allow for filtering of that stormwater too. So this is an image of vegetated soil. And you probably saw this if you walked in along the main road coming in because it's along the parking lot um, and it's a um, sloped system filled with native plants. You can see the limestone rock wall on the left and a gabion rock wall on the right. And at the top of this slide, you can see the overhead view. So that entire red uh, uh, rectangular system is the swale. Well. So it goes the entire length of the parking lot and then comes along here. So if you walked out of this building, to the end, that is part of that swale, and it's directing it from the right to the left as we're looking at, at it from here. And there's some photos of it, and it's filled with a lot of really interesting native vegetation. One of my favorites is button bush in there, doing really well. And this is what it looked like when it was going in. You can't really see all of these components anymore because it is so vegetated with those native plants. But as you can see, it's sloped and then it's got these partition baffles, so those uh, steel walls that you see right there, and there's little notches in the middle. And so what those do, because it's sloped, as the stormwater runoff is moving through, those baffles slow it down and stop it. And if it is below that wall, it'll just sink in and infiltrate into the ground. If it is above that notch, then it'll go over and keep going through. And so you can see the walls on either side are a little higher. So it could actually carry quite a bit more water if needed. And then the last practice I want to talk about is stormwater cisterns. Most of us are familiar with these above ground cisterns. In fact, this photo is from Bill Harbor Park East off of the Blanco entrance. This is what we see a lot of. But here at the Urban Ecology Center, there's actually a really large underground cistern. And um, I should also point out there's some interpretive signage. If you want to know some more details and see a cross section of this right outside here on the walls where they have the interpretive panels that talk a lot more about the stormwater management if you're interested. Um, but you can see at the end of that vegetated swale, anything that makes it through that swale will go into the vegetated system above a large stormwater sector and it can store 10,000 gallons of water. And they have a pump system that can use that water for supplemental irrigation if needed. You can see the construction picture. And so you may or may not have noticed um, those decorative features that actually collect the water from the rooftop here of all of these buildings and direct them into these um, collection chambers that then send them into the, uh, some of it goes into the swale and some of it goes right into the underground system. And then here's just an image at the end of the system. Um, this is where the overflow of that cistern, it, it can collect on top. And those arrows are showing some cutouts in that wall. Again, those would serve in the same way that the cutouts on those baffles did to allow water to pass through if it needs to, if there's an excess of water in there. But it slows it down, it holds it in place, and lets it infiltrate down and in, into the cistern there. And then it's a nice, um, deck area, a nice observation area, and you can actually see because native plants have been used in throughout these systems, they're also serving for wildlife habitat. And so the treatment train portion of that is how we have the multiple practices that lead into each other. And so they're distributed around the area, but they're also connected to each other, and that's what's called a treatment train. So there's more um, out here. And as I mentioned earlier, next month, we're gonna have uh, Wendy Leonard talking about the amazing land bridge. That's another nature-based infrastructure element that's uh, really uh, impressive. Can't wait to hear about that. So um, happy to answer any questions, if there are any. Otherwise, we, oh, there is one right there. 
You keep the weeds out of the so you can vote the granite because it's just manual. Well, I should point out that I do not maintain or manage. So the question was, how do you keep the weeds out of the decomposed granite? And as Haley pointed out, and as many of us have observed in other places, decomposed granite is a really good substrate for seeds and little seedlings to grow. Um, the benefit of it is that it's also usually pretty easy to pull out those seedlings from the decomposed granite, but yes, it would require hand removal. In the parking lot situation, I'm not sure if they worry about seedlings too much. I mean, some of them would be um, uh, killed by the car parking on them. That wouldn't be a problem, but um, I'm not sure how they actually do it here. We, we can save that question for Wendy if she, if she uh, gets into it next, next month. Yeah. I have to point oh. out decomposed granite is also very good for trucking into your house. <laughs> decomposed granite is very good for trucking into your house. Um, I would like to ask if you're right. So yeah. it's not great on slopes. And so a lot of people have used it thinking that's a beneficial material um, and it's great on flat surfaces. But when it's on slopes, if there's water moving across it, you can get quite a bit of erosion. So it there's a, it, it needs to, it's really best for flatter surfaces. Did you have a question? Yeah, about the open area where, for rainwater catchment, how do you manage the mosquitoes? Oh, that's a great question. So the question is for those stormwater management areas, how do you manage mosquitoes? And the practices that I showed you, the swale, and then the area above the cistern, those are designed to have that water move through quickly. So they would, the water would not stand in those when they're functioning properly. It's not intended for water to be ponded there for 24, more than 24 hours. And that's how most of these practices um, are designed. Other examples that I didn't show, but uh, are similar are rain gardens. And you maybe have heard of rain gardens, bioretention. There's, there are other systems. They're just meant to slow the water down, hold it for a little bit, and, and ideally let it filter in and get, get filtered and clean by the plants, by the soils, by the mulch, by all the microorganisms that are interacting in the system. And so they, they really offer the best, um, the vegetated systems offer the best treatment. They are not meant to be ponds. That's a whole separate type of a practice. Any other questions? Oh, there's one back there. You know, I am not sure. The question was, has an underground system ever been full? Um, I did speak with uh, staff here when these were first constructed. And so most of my photos showing the construction are, are that at that time, um, which was years ago. And I'm not sure. I imagine it's possible when we had those two back-to-back -back big events that were like five-inch events, two at a time, sometime in the pandemic, whenever that was, 2021 maybe, someone will remember. I imagine it could have possibly been filled. It, it really is not, it is surprising how quickly 10,000 gallons can be captured from runoff of, of surfaces. So I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know for sure that answer. So in so the question is how do you keep the water clean? And in cisterns in general, um, you might have a slight difference in the underground versus the above ground, but there's algae everywhere. And where there's water and there's algae in there, you will usually get some algae growth. And so in many cases, um, again, most of the cisterns around our area are, are those above ground cisterns they'll put um, a little bit of a bleach solution in there to treat the algae. And most of these cisterns are designed so that they're not, uh, they don't allow light in. You, you would really have a lot bigger problem if you had something that was clear or something that was translucent, you would get a lot more algae growth. So most of these have a really solid dark um, exterior to prevent it, but there's, it still happens in there. And then the other issue with cisterns is um, mosquitoes can find openings. And so that's another issue that, that you need to deal with with these, these um, practices. I, I'm, the below grounds might not be as difficult as the above ground. The above ground systems have a lot of openings where the mosquitoes can find their way in. And so it's using really fine screens 
And when you do see a problem, trying to figure out if there's uh, an opening that needs to be sealed um, or uh, possibly putting in those mosquito ducts is uh, one of the solutions. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's really great to see such a great crowd here tonight. Um, my name is Teresa Maslanka, and I'm here with Joe Miller tonight to talk to you about the Plants by Donation program. Um, this program is relatively new. Um, it's a program to get member grown plants into the hands of those looking for native plants. So this idea arose during COVID when um, we found plant sales uh, a little too tricky to manage. We needed a, a, a creative solution that took into account social distancing um, in order to continue to get native plants distributed. Yeah, so what the heck does plants by donation mean? I bet you want a translation because I've heard it called plants X program, plant X, whatever. But what it is, it's plants grown by members. X is another, it's a symbol for the word by and then donation in two senses of the word. We've got donations of plants that people have brought in that they've grown themselves. And then donations as well, which is monetary um, cash given to the Native Plant Society in exchange for those plants that then people take home. So call it what you like. Our aim is to get you involved and get you plants. Okay, so how does it work? Now we see, we understand now that there's a donation component on both ends. The members are donating their plants. People are, that get plants get to make donations. So we've got that, but how does it work? So it's really very easy. Um, there's three steps and there's two different options for um, donating and picking up plants. So members can grow and bring their plants to chapter meetings, or they can go online and add them to the online inventory. And then you can get those donated plants at the chapter meeting or via the online inventory. So we're going to go into a little more detail on that in a moment. Okay, so you've got plants. So what do you do with them? Um, so you harvest them and either you can dig them out of your yard or maybe you've grown them from seed. What do you do? Well, if it's a large clump, like it is pictured up there, that's a baby blue eyes. Um, you wanna try to dig the entire clump or a large portion of it. You can plop it in a plastic bag and bring it to a meeting um, and then, uh, but do that no more than a couple of days before the meeting um, and, uh, or you can transplant it into a pot. You want to try to get a good root system. And um, anyway, so then uh, the, op of the alternative is you can take that clump or a seedling that you've dug out or grown from, grown from a seed, um, and use some potting soil with it, put it in, say, a four inch pot, a gallon pot, whatever. And, um, you know, try to pot up at least a week, if not more beforehand. So it's established um, to get more roots growing and for making for a better looking plant. Um, and I guess, are those all our notes? Yeah, I feel like there's more. I think there is more. Just to see. <laughs> I'm not sure to write that one. Okay. Well, anyway, so, because, yeah, there we go. Thought I, so labeling as well. We ask that you please try to label your plants if you're bringing them in. If you don't quite know the full name, the Latin name and the common name, we can help you out there. We can also give you some, uh, some blank uh, labels or you can just use anything you want, but it's very helpful because people like to know what the name of the plant is that they take home because most people, they get it home and go, oh, I, I thought I was gonna remember what this was. And then it's just total blank. Um, so anyway, so that's, and also then they can look it up when they get home too. Usually on Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is a good place to look it up. Although the state is, is going to, 
probably within the next year have its own database of amazing information about the, the native landscape plants all over the state with lots of great information. So keep, we'll keep you posted on that. That's not good. Oh, it's probably because it touched it. <laughs> okay. And so if you've got some seeds, same thing. Go ahead, collect some seeds, put them in a little envelope, try to get the common and the uh, Latin name. We can help you figure out a Latin name, perhaps. <laughs> and then um, we can list those online, or you can bring them to the meeting and we can get rid of them that way. So um, an exciting aspect of the program is that this allows plants to be available all year round. Normally, back in the past, pre-COVID, we had two plant sales a year, and we had a lot of member-grown plants as well, and that was kind of really where you got them. Well, now we've got two methods to, to get the member-grown plants out there, because our whole plant sale concept has changed a lot over the years. So one is to monthly chapter meetings. I'm amazed at how many plants are already gone, um, but we're hoping that you know more and more people will get involved. Bring in your plants every every month. That's that would be a great place for you to um, to share them. Or else we can list them online. There's a uh, you can go to this tiny URL slash plants by donation plants x donation and um, you can get your plant listed. And then we'll go into that a little bit as well. But um, you know, if you just want to keep your plant at home and you don't come to meetings, there's still a way for someone to get your plants. Oh, I'm to right on it. Wrong one. <laughs> I'm touching okay. the wrong one. That's why. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about giving and getting plants at the chapter meeting. I originally thought I was going to say, wow, look at all those member plants over there, but there's hardly any left now. So um, if you stopped by the table earlier today, you would have seen such a variety of plants available. Um, I know that a lot of these are going home already. There's a few more left. So um, the question that we often hear is, hey, how many can I take? And I say, you take as many as you like. We won't think you're greedy. These plants are for you, and most importantly, we want to see these plants out in your landscapes. And then another question that we often hear is, well, how much do I owe now? Well, donat donations are optional, and how much is a personal choice? Um, if it's something that you see there that you've always wanted and you've never seen in a nursery, you might want to you know, make a nice little donation in the box. But if you're picking up for community garden with limited resources, just go for it and get it in the ground. That's what's really important. What about um, at the next meeting? Can I bring in some plants then that I have? Yes. Um, again, uh, we definitely <laughs> encourage that. Um, and it may be just at different times of the year that you feel that you can bring anything in that, that you've grown from mm -hmm. seed or you dig out. But um, just remember, it must be a Texas native plant to be included. Um, and try to make it look good in the pot. Remove some dead material. Please wipe off the pot so that it's clean for someone to take it home. And then remember, the better it looks, the more likely it will go home with someone. Which brings me to, if your plants weren't taken by the end of the meeting, keep an eye on them, please take them back home with you. We don't want to take them home and be foster parents for <laughs> however long. Um, so uh, you can bring it back the next month. Maybe it'll be more vigorous or um, you can list it on the online inventory as well. Um, or give it to a neighbor or something. So that's another option. That's right. You might find that um, people will bring in pots too. So if you need some, some um, materials so that you can dig up your own pots, then check it out. If the pots don't go home, please take them home. Right. <laughs> okay. So let's say you're not attending chapter meetings in person though, but you still want to participate. That's when you go to the website, to the Plants by Donation program page, and you'll see three different actions that you can take. So um, 
really it kind of depends on what you want to do. Do you want to donate plants? Then click on that, that first button that says, um, I have plants or seeds to list. And that will add your plants to the inventory. Um, let's say that you want plants that are listed in the inventory. Then you click on that middle button that says, I want plants from the list. And you let us know which plants you want. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna get you connected to the members that have those plants. But let's just remember that the only plants available are those that are on the list. So, you know, don't click that button and say, hey, do you have this other plant that's not listed? Because we won't, really won't be able to help you out right now. Maybe we'll get in the future, but you know, only what's up there right now. And remember, it needs to be a Texas native, please. Because I think we've got requests for tomato plants. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we should say that on every slide, perhaps. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's say that you have already picked up a plant and you come back to this page and you want to make a donation. Um, so that's what the third button is. Just click on that and you'll go to an online form where you can enter, enter your credit card. Okay, so now comes the fun part. You've requested your plants online and you've talked with the member who has them and now it's time to pick them up. So these plants may already be in pots uh, or the member may pot them after they hear that you want them because maybe they don't wanna dig them up and have them sitting around in pots and not know if somebody wants them. Um, still others may be still in the ground and that member might ask you, hey, come over and let's dig them up together. Um, that's an option too. You, you two will discuss that and decide in advance how you wanna handle that. And then you'll go over and um, typically pick them up from the individual's house, um, or perhaps they'll bring them to the chapter meeting if you prefer, you know, if you're close to a chapter meeting. So um, yeah, it's a couple of different ways to do it. Yeah, and you know, it's actually kind of fun to the, the interaction, having people come to your house or going to someone's house to pick up plants. Um, you can learn a lot more about the plant, um, where it came from in someone else's yard who's providing it and sort of see how, it, uh, how it's behaving in their garden. Um, they might have other plants in pots um, or to dig that you'd like, you know, as you're walking around their yard. Um, I have sent, I have sent more plants away with visitors than they came for because I tend to keep a bit of an inventory at home. So I can always give them, get them to take more plants. Um, but if I've got something that's too big and, you know, they notice that my twist leaf yucca in the shade there, it's like, I said, well, you know, I've been meaning to get rid of that. Let's just go dig it up right now. You can take it home with you. So there's another benefit. Um, you, maybe you didn't realize that you needed that plant, but we can help. Um, a garden tour also is a great, it's a great opportunity to see someone else's yard. I've heard feedback from someone who said, she said, I just love going to other people's houses, seeing what their yards look like, because there's so many different approaches to native landscapes. And it's kind of gave her also a lot more confidence mm -hmm. in how she should approach her own yard, that it doesn't need to be just one thing. So um, yeah, and it's also, it's a gr just a great way to meet more people um, who love native plants that, that here in San Antonio. Okay, so let's say you got some of these wonderful plants and you wanna make a donation. There's many different ways you can do that. At the meetings, you can just drop some cash into one of those boxes over there. Um, you can click the QR code and enter a credit card if you like. Um, and so if you prefer, you can go online to the Plants by Donation page on our website and donate there or buy this tiny URL that's up on the screen slash donate dash NPSOTSA if you'd rather do it that way. But remember, these donations, they are completely optional. Someone without the resources should be able to obtain plants and there should be no barrier to receiving any. So whether, you're not, whether or not you donate is private, no one will know as is the amount that you donate. That's right, that's right. And if you bring plants and want to exchange for other plants, that's fine too. You know, yeah. it's, it's all your choice. You can bring plants and not exchange. Doesn't really matter, it's totally up to you.
Okay, well, thanks so much for listening. And um, does anybody have any questions about how the program works? Okay. okay. Do, do these have to be native Texas plants? <laughs> So the question is, <laughs> do these need to be Texas native plants? Absolutely, yes. Thank you, Fred, that, making that clear. That should have been our quiz question. That's right. <laughs> so if, if you ever have questions or need advice um, or supplies along the way, you can reach out to Joan or, or Rocia so um, there, right okay. here or myself. We're on the plant cell committee. And Alicia was helping us out today. There she is. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes, um, we're happy to help. Yep. And there is a question, oh, okay. Norma, right? Did yes. you have a question? Um, uh, as far as the cucumber cells, if that, that plant that was once listed and that was not available, is there a way to remove the cucumber Yes, yes. Um, basically, oh, sorry. Yes. The question is if you have added a plant to the online inventory, but you no longer have that plant available, how do you get that removed? You, I believe, Rocio, just correct me if I'm wrong here. Basically, you're in touch with people after they list their plants and they can, and they'll have your email address and they can email you or they could go to that first button that said, I have plants and just note that, can you please remove X plant? I also think, Rocio, that you sometimes reach out to people who have suggested that they have plants on occasion to see what they still have available. Is that right? Yes, but it would be great if they have run out of plants, if they could just shoot me an email and just say, it's gone. Okay. And that would be very helpful because then we can get it off the website much faster. Okay, so Rocio suggests that um, once you've listed your plants, <laughs> she'll be in touch with you. And if your plant is given away, just email her and let her know, and then she can take it off. And I, I also, um, so I can never remember what I've posted on the inventory. So what I do to Rocio every couple of weeks or months or whatever is I'll say, all right, this is what I've got now. Anything that I had on the list before, just remove, okay? Because it's kind of hard to keep yeah. to keep track. That's true. That's so. a really good way to take care of it. Yeah. We can handle yeah. it either that way. Works. That works. Either way. Okay. okay. All right. Oh, the next one? Yeah. yeah.